So we had our discussion last week, and so we didn't do we didn't necessarily talk directly about compassion. We've got four more weeks of compassion for the rest of August, which is going to be perfect. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about is um, from a learner series that I taught. I don't know. It's actually probably been like a year and a half or two now. Um, talking about compassion, there are several different concepts that um, I think are important to point out. When we're talking about compassion, first of all, um, compassion isn't necessarily sympathy. And it's not pitying somebody. Um, that's coming at a person or a situation with a different kind of intention. Do you help an old woman across the street because you pity her? Or because um, you feel the desire to help her, you know, carry her things, or to make sure she gets across the street because there's traffic and who knows what can happen, and maybe you think about your grandmother. So it's the intention behind the act or the feeling, and it's not pity, because pity, I don't know. Pity is a judgment. Yeah, pity, yeah, pity is a judgment, you're right. And so, um, whereas compassion is coming from a non-judgmental place, getting that concept set in place, um, part two is there, the compassion goes in many directions. And one of the um, one of the things that we'll talk about in practice and discuss is um, the sort of the Buddhist way of thinking about compassion and the practice of um, their um, compassion meditations, for example. And you practice, uh, and this is actually in the book that uh, the fear a fearless heart practicing feeling compassion to somebody, somebody you love already. That's easy enough. You know, I can feel compassion in my heart for Aaron because I love him, and that's not hard. You, so you start practicing compassion. And, and, and feeling compassion isn't necessarily an easy thing for people. It does take practice. And there's um, a TED Talk. Let me see if I can find it quickly. Um, there's a TED talk by a Swami Dayananda Saraswati, <laughs> um, and he he talks quite a bit about fake it till you make it. And we use this term for a lot of things, like you know, if you're nervous to to give a speech or something like that, you just fake it. You act like you got your act together until you really feel like you do. But with compassion, um, it can be a feeling that you build up, that you can honestly learn to feel for somebody. Um, and so you start practicing compassion towards somebody that you already care about. And then you practice compassion for um, somebody who you, um, I don't know, you don't have any feelings one way or the other, like the guy at the bagel store, you know, like you want him to have a good day, right? Yeah, you know, and, and you want, you would like him to, uh, you know, to be happy and free from suffering. And then you think about um, feeling compassion towards um, yourself, and that's the hard one, truly. Um, in a certain way, but then you also work on practicing compassion for people you don't care about very much. So, um, one of the, when I started the Compassion Learner Series, my primary intention in the practice was for me to feel compassion towards our brand new president because I didn't want four years of my heart being ripped out and my soul being destroyed and feeling just anger and allowing that to hurt me. And then that would, you know, and the feelings that I would have would then, you know, 
drip into everybody else's life that I touched. So it was very important for me to try to resolve that within myself. And then, so then you practice compassion for somebody that you may feel animosity towards. And then also then feeling compassion for the entire universe and just visualizing like, so at the end of my classes, I do the English translation. It's a loose translation. So there's a Sanskrit mantra that you say that's Loka Samasta Sukhi No Bhavantu and loosely translated, um, may all beings in the universe be happy and free from suffering. And may our thoughts and actions contribute to their happiness and freedom. Um, and so that is where you're just applying that to everybody because truly, like, if we were all happy and if we were all free from whatever our suffering is, this would be a wonderful place to live and everybody would have everything that they needed. So that, that's one type of practice, practicing compassion and doing baby steps. And even, you know, these Buddhists who seem to be extremely compassionate people who can do all the things that, that seem compassionate, even they practice it. One word that I do want to bring up is, it's one of the, um, it's one of the yamas. Ahimsa is non-violence. And non-violence isn't simply not physically hurting somebody. It's not having it's refraining from judgmental thoughts, from negative thoughts for somebody else, but also for yourself. So all of this compassion stuff is talking about compassion for others, but also compassion for yourself. Thinking back to, you know, the perfect example is on an airplane. They tell you, you take the oxygen mask first, and then you help the person that you're with. You take care of yourself first, you fill yourself up, you feel um, healthy, well, happy, and so forth, and then you have energy that you can give to somebody who may not feel happy or well. So feeling compassion for yourself is important, but it's hard. When I feel compassion for somebody, when I um, uh, do something for somebody. Yes, I'm doing it for them, but also because I'm getting something from it as well. Um, I'm getting, it, you know, it actually, like, acts of compassion help boost your immune system. I mean, they truly, compassion uh, and positive thinking truly make you a healthier person. Um, but that, that instant feeling of, yeah, that felt really good to do something for somebody else. And so we're both getting something from it. It's like, when I give you a gift, yeah, I want you to like it, but actually, I just really enjoyed giving you something. Like, I went, I thought of something, and I went to the store, and I'm actually extremely bad at giving gifts. Anybody who's gotten a gift from me knows, like, I'm just not good at buying things for people. I have all the intentions. But, so when I do actually find something, it's like, it's like just as much my birthday as it is yours because I was so excited to find something. But that's the thing with compassion is that both people gain something from an act of compassion. And so by choosing, intentionally practicing compassion, you're making yourself a healthier, happier person just by doing that. Taking from that and going into segueing into the article, that I posted on the Facebook page. The journalist, Michael Stockmore, he was kidnapped, I don't know if that's the right word, abducted, held um, for ransom by Somali pirates. And uh, after several months of being held captive, he asked them for a yoga mat because he was just trapped in the cell and he, his body hurt. And so what he knew to do was yoga. And so he asked for a yoga mat. Apparently they thought about it and got him a yoga mat. And then after months of him practicing yoga, the, um, the, the Somalis on the outside of his cell, who were just sitting there watching him, watching over him to make sure that he doesn't do anything, 
um, they started asking him about yoga, and then they started practicing with him. And then after months and months, he actually started correcting their form, and then started giving little yoga classes to his captors. And so that example um, is very similar to, and again, I think there's a story about it in A Fearless Heart. And I can't remember the details of it, um, but there's, um, I can't remember if it's a Tibetan man. Anyway, he's held captive, and in order to survive, he didn't allow himself to hate. I think it was the Chinese held him captive or something like that. Maybe he was a prisoner of war, but he didn't allow himself to feel hate for the people who were, were keeping him prisoner. Because he knew, number one, these people were doing it because their government told them this is what they had to do. But also, he knew that by harboring these feelings in himself would only destroy him more, and on some level would feed into what they were trying to do to him anyway. It would make him more of a prisoner, and more of their prisoner, and also you know, somewhat of a prisoner of himself by being held captive by this hate. So, being able to not hold so much hate and perhaps even feel compassion, teach a yoga class to the people that are holding you captive, I mean, that's mind-blowing. And he survived. Um, so, his, his interview on NPR is just, it's really moving. It's amazing what he went through um, and that he was able to um, apply uh, what I would say would be like the, the utmost concept of yoga um, while, he was, while he was there. I don't know that that was necessarily his thought or intention necessarily, but it helped him. Um, I think that's very, it's a very important story, both sides of these bars, seeing each other as humans, whereas at first, perhaps they didn't see each other as humans, um, and sort of breaking that down. So there are different types of exercises, and we're going to do a few different ones throughout the month. Right now for us, it's 8 o'clock at night, so bedtime is coming up. There's a, um, a practice called Nikon. This Practice is based on three simple questions. 20 to 30 minutes before bedtime, sit in a quiet place and write down the answers to the three questions in relation to today's events. What did you see? What did you receive from others? What did you give to others? And what troubles and difficulties did you cause for others? And you become as specific as possible. Uh, what did I receive today? What have I given to others? So this is where you know, the practice of this, um, this exercise is challenging because then I have to think about, okay, I got all these wonderful things from people today. Did I do something? And so, number one, I have to look seriously at the things that I did today and then be, get over myself and say, yeah, you know what, like, I think I did something good today. And then troubles and what troubles and difficulties have I caused others today? But when you in starting the practice, it allows you to reflect on your day and recognize that people do things for me, and I do things for people, and I also have an impact on people's lives, good or bad. Then the next day, perhaps these things are still in my head, these thoughts and recognizing that what I do right now, what kind of difference do I want to make right now? Um, do I want to make a positive difference? Can I make a positive difference? Can I take this moment right now and make sure that it's, that I'm leaving it better than I got into it? So some days you may not have any. I don't know. Cause of difficulties. Maybe, you don't know, but think about it. So yesterday we went to Aldi and Going up, I had my quarter, and then there was two little girls that were coming up pushing the cart, and I was like, hey, I'll trade you. And I thought that that was great. 
you know, because the rest of us do that or whatever. And then as we're walking into Aldi, the little girls, they start to cry. And I'm like, what did I do? And um, I thought, well, maybe because I handed the quarter to one girl but not the other. And Aaron, who has a kid and thinks about children, he's like, because they wanted to do the little thing where you plug it in and get the quarter out. And I'm like, oh my god. Like, that, like, destroyed my day. And I'm like, I caused that little girl, to, not only her, but then her mom had to calm her down. And so maybe it wasn't, it was not intentional. I had all the best intentions, but I definitely caused several people some difficulty because of that. Had, would I have done it differently? I don't know. I mean, it, now I know that kids really like to do the old Kurt thing. I will not give them a quarter. I will let them get it for themselves. However, I don't know if it was karma on the quarter. I got my car broken into. And the only thing that they stole was that damn quarter from Molly. Oh. <laughs> but, but those are the little things. So unintentional difficulties that you've, that you've caused others. Um, maybe you accidentally cut somebody off and you didn't need to. So those little things. So it's an awareness. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so maybe in the moment, it doesn't occur to you. And then afterwards, like tonight, when you're reflecting on it, maybe you're like, Okay, yeah, I could have done that a little bit better. Or, maybe you still wouldn't have changed anything. Because maybe I did want that extra thing from the coffee shop. And it's on the menu. You just don't have it out here. It's in the back. So, yeah. But recognizing that making sure that I did thank the person and all of that. Making sure that you're showing appreciation when somebody does, when I do cause somebody difficult. You know, those are the interesting things when you're reflecting on your day. Again, just recognizing that you make an impact more than you may realize. Do you think the practice of that each night calls for you the next day to make amends? Even on the small things? Do you think so? I would think that would depend on your own heart, like how you feel about that. Um, there have been plenty of things where I have um, like just been so burdened by, um, and actually just this past weekend, um, um, I felt really bad about a way that I responded in the workshop that I was at, and felt that I was a little bit rude, and so I kind of apologized, kind of, I didn't fully, I kind of apologized kind of just explained my actions to one of the people that I felt that I referred to. Um, and that was to sort of ease my own heart about it, but at the same time, um, it what it did for the gal was it allowed her to open up and say that she felt the same way I did because I was trying to figure out whether or not I belonged. You know, feeling overwhelmed in a class full of people with more experience, that seemed to have their act together more, that were more yoga than me, that were physical therapists, that were nutritionists, all of these things, and my feelings of inadequacy, um, you know, imposter syndrome, why am I here? Why do I think I can do this? And so in sort of half-ass apologizing to her, she said, oh yeah, I'm working on those same feelings myself. And she was one of the people that I'm like, oh my god, she's amazing. How could I ever be like her? And finding out that she's feeling the same exact way. Um, so, so I would say, like, if it feels good to ease your mind or your heart about it, sure. Um, and I think for some of us, it is nice to actually, like, it's almost like, the, I don't want to say that it's penance, but that a little bit of fear that you have walking up to somebody to apologize, not only are you apologizing, and apologizing is hard, but you're also like admitting you were wrong. And, um, and that's hard too. And you're making yourself vulnerable. You don't know how they're going to respond. And so a little bit of that is a little bit cathartic. Like that little bit of fear 
um, and then having done it. It's like almost that sort of like pulling off the band-aid saying like, God, it's almost like um, doing like a big loud, like, you know, a big exhale helps to release like pain and deep feelings. So that little bit of yeah, something when you go to apologize for something you felt really bad about, um, that in and of itself, I think, is a good release. So again, like it's for both of you. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and you know, and, and spending like, you know, again, 20 to 30 minutes, it doesn't have to take up your whole evening. But also like the act of writing down. Do you write in a journal? I mean, you've got to start it too. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's such a it's such a good feeling and. You know, when it comes to writing in journals, and like, talk about this, you know, in one of the learner series we did for journaling. Be honest. Um, yeah, maybe someday somebody's going to read your journal, hopefully you're dead, and they, you know, you don't have to deal with it. But if you're going to bother writing in a journal, then be as honest as possible. And omitting doesn't count. So not saying something does not count as being honest. Saying it, saying the hardest thing. And that's why I like this practice because having to write down these hard things that I really just want to like ignore the fact that I did something terrible that I didn't mean to. I just like it to go away. Well, write it down and be honest about it. And maybe by writing it out and seeing that, that helps to you. Um, yeah, I, I, I recommend journaling. So, uh, how, how often do you journal? Every day I have three different journals. Yeah. So this is my mm -hmm. one for notes, yeah. things that I want to expand upon. Mm -hmm. And then I journal, like I'm journaling from the book that you let me. Yeah. The Fearless Heart? Yeah. The Fearless Heart. Go back and reread those thoughts. So those are not my own ideas. Sometimes I might make a little comment. Yeah. And then I have my other journal. For your for for like, like a diary yeah. type journal. Yeah. 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 And I think that's good. I think a lot of people do have people who journal I think sometimes have multiple journals. Because you I mean you're 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 organizing your thoughts a little bit differently. So yeah. since I went through, you know, some life changes. I felt the desire to get rid of those journals that no longer define yeah. my own life. So. How'd you get rid of them? Uh, I gave them to a friend and she took them to the country and burned them. Nice. Why um, didn't you burn them? I didn't know where to do that. Oh, I see. Okay. I see. Okay. All right. There's condo rules. I'm always, <laughs> I'm always in trouble. So I don't want to, I don't want to get the. Burning journals yeah. is not approved by the condo association. <laughs> and so that's what I kind of intend as I go through different times. I don't, do you go back and reread what you wrote in your big Not picture? really. Yeah. I don't. Um, I think that, and actually, so I got rid of, I don't know what I did with them. I think I burned them. I honestly don't remember, but I got rid of a bunch of journals that I had written in high school. And um, then I got rid of a bunch of journals from my first marriage. Yeah. And um, I've, the, only, the only reason I've gone past through old journals was, number one, I actually had a journal entry from September 11th before I knew anything had happened. I had written in my journal that morning, and then on my way to work, that's when everything happened. Um, and so like, it was interesting to read in my journal that like, I had a date for later in the day, and like yeah. my nerves about that, or whatever. Um, so that was it. Was interesting to see how like in the morning everything was great, and then all of a sudden like it was not. Uh, life yeah, life did change. And then the only other time I went back at my journals was um, recently when my mom, after my mom died, looking back at journals, just a few of them honestly. Like I didn't want to dig through um, too much. Um, but yeah, but otherwise no. Like I think the act of writing in the journal, that's enough. And that I see as a form of compassion to myself. Because honestly, like one of the past journal
journal entries that I wrote, I found after I'd finished the book about my mom, and I in the in my entry, I was so angry at her. I had so much anger and hatred toward my mother, and this was before she was diagnosed with dementia. And like I felt that coming back up inside me, and I'm like, there's a reason why I wrote it then, and then eight years passed, and my feelings about her and life and everything changed. It's no good for me to have that feeling again. So, yeah, so like, I, I stopped reading it, I didn't finish reading the whole entry, because it's like, it doesn't do any good to go back and rehash that. I'm a different person. You know, every moment we're different people. Another thing I want to end with, here in the studio, I've got this statue. Um, this is the Goddess of Compassion. Um, I got this when Byzantium was closing and they were selling off all their stuff. Um, so this is so this goddess has a couple different names. Um, so she's, I'm gonna, she's generally an Asian goddess, and um, the Chinese, her Chinese name is Kuan Yin. Her, um, I'm not sure what language of Indian it is, but Avelo Kiteshvara. Um, so she's the goddess of compassion. Uh, compassion is an important enough concept to have its own goddess. Next week, we will talk more about compassion. Um, what I would like to suggest, a few things to suggest for our upcoming sessions. The Center for Mindful Self-Compassion has a self-compassion test. And I recommend that. So I'll put the, the link up on the on the screen here. We'll take that, I think that, and again, you got to be honest, and it'll give you an idea of what you need to work on, how really compassionate you are towards yourself. And then one other thing that I highly recommend is if you're not into TED Talks, get into TED Talks, because they did a whole TEDx series on compassion. So look for the Charter of Compassion on TED Talks, Check them out. I went down that rabbit hole and like literally spent like a day. And like I'm just sitting there just like sobbing and like, oh my god, it's so beautiful. I can't let it be like this. I can't ever be really compassionate. Um, but they're just nice reminders, you know. And so I go back and I rewatch them every once in a while because there's just so much information in these TED Talks. They're so compacted, you know, 10 to 15, 18 minutes. And, you know, the way that they give you this information, there's so much. And so it's really good to like go back again and again and you'll hear something different the next time.